it's academic and it's theater and the place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. This makes your practices a start of the practices culture. Come on. Everybody, please. Samples of women. Sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that you know anymore. We're from all around. Would you can come and see the talk about? So welcome everybody to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and thank you for watching our propaganda video. Um, <laughs> but it's good to know, you know, what also what we uh, do here. It's a very big day for us. It's the opening actually of the Pen World Voices um, Festival, a great festival, perhaps the most significant festival of literature in the Americas, definitely North America. And it was founded by Paul Auster and Salman Rushdie during the first Bush government where they felt there was not enough uh, listening uh, to voices from around the world. There was a tunnel vision. 95% of all books published are in English language from American or British writers. The other half, uh, the other 5% are German for, or, or French. And so only two books maybe are, you know, are from writers from the 180 or 200 nations around the world. And musicians listen to world music. It's very important for their local practice to think globally. And I think in theater we have to do the same. So this is our small contribution. For over 10 years, we are the partner of Penn. And it is really right at the center. It's very, very important to us. So, and thank you for taking time out of your life to come at uh, 4 o'clock. It's been finally some sun is out. Uh, so it really means a lot to us. We need good theater, but we also need good audiences, audience who are interested. So it really means a lot to us. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Frank Henschko. I am the director of the Siegel Center. And we bridge academia and professional theater international and American theater here. So uh, this is right at the heart of what we do. And also the opening of this festival, we've worked for almost a year on this. We have uh, eight of the 10 writers coming. It's a big thing for us, a big investment also. Uh, we fundraise for it. We um, don't take uh, you know any admission fee, so we are really honored and that the writers are coming and that we are able to pay them and that we are part of that important chorus. Also check out Penbold. Voices Festival right now, it's going on this week. Brilliant program, fantastic programs. What a chip uh, put together, the new curator. It's really an, an amazing uh, array and it makes New York City what New York um, City um, is. Um, the beginning and the end of a play, as one said, is the big moments. In between, people forgive you what you do. So again, this is the beginning then of our uh, festival. So this is also important. And we have with us here um, Magali. Uh, Mugel, who came from France with us uh, to be with us. Uh, she flew in on Saturday or Sunday. She's going to fly back uh, uh, tomorrow. So, and he will join us for a discussion afterwards. The reading will be about 55 minutes. And um, please fill out our little audience forms because we always want to know where you come from. You can keep the pencil, it's our gift to you. <laughs> and if that is any, uh, any, um, thing worthy enough for you to do, so uh, please, please do it. If you have a cell phone, um, please do take it out. I'll do the same if I find mine. Here it is. <laughs> and it should be ringer off. Okay. And your eye watches. And I think so. Thank you um, um, very much. And um, you can leave the forms outside or give them uh, when you go out. But again, thank you all for coming. And now it's the beginning of our festival. And again, thanks for you, Chen, for producing it, Michael. Bella and uh, everybody up there, Salma, who is stage managing, uh, Elida, Brooke, who joined us. So this is a big moment for us. Thank you for coming. And here is the beginning of the first reason, Susie Stork. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
starts. It starts here. It happens here, right here. The exact geography of where it happens doesn't matter. It happens in the house of Susie Stork and Hans Vasily Cruz. 17th of June, 1037 at night. The sun still hasn't set. In the kitchen, wine bottles on Susie Stork's table. Three, more or less empty. Susie Stork is by the window, waiting. Waiting for Hans Vasily Cruz to come home. And it all comes back to her, like a body from the earth, like a story you dig up. Her unfortunate failure to adequately express her desire to refuse to fulfill certain obligations of a personal, physical, and indeed economic character. Her desire to refuse to fulfill her conjugal duty by not having any children. This is how the story starts. It happens here, right here. 17th of June, 8.54 p.m. We hear the sound of a car in the distance. A car started, moving off. Susie Stork is there, with her face stuck to the window. Not moving, waiting. Heavy heat, just before the storm. An evening when the setting sun never actually sets. Susie feels the need for another drink. In the distance, upstairs, we hear the, the sound of children's voices. We hear the sound of tiny hands jiggling something metal in the lock. A knock on the glass front door. Open this door, Susie! Susie, do you hear me? Open this wretched door! And Susie Stork goes to the door. And up goes Susie Stork's hand. And Susie Stork's hand rests on the door handle. And Susie Stork's hand opens the door. Madam Stork comes in, sits down, face to face, either side of the same table. They look at each other. For a long time, they look. There's plenty they could say, but they don't. Madam Stork slaps Susie once, twice. How is it possible that a woman like me could end up with a daughter like you? I tore myself to pieces. I did everything. I mean, I never said a word. I always held my tongue. I've been a good mother. I'm certainly not the worst. I've spared you everything, and you, I'm ashamed of you. Disarray, the disarray of my life, that's you. I look back at how I got here, how you, how we got here. Complete disarray. I don't know what to say. To quantify the things I've done and, and those I can't, I know nothing for sure. I'm facing you here, Mother, and I can't quantify anything anymore. And I don't know if there was ever a time when I could. I can't quantify any of it. All I did was try to hold something together, a dead chick in the shell. I don't want anything back. I'd like to keep quiet, but I don't want to take anything back. I'm scared for when Hans Vasily comes back. Asking me for an explanation? I don't know what'll happen when he gets home. You think he'll give you a kiss? I don't think there'll be flowers. At best, he'll strangle you, and at worst, he'll set fire to your hair. Don't look at me like that. How would you like me to look at you? You think I should say, well done? I should drag you to the sink by the scrap and drown you. That's what you deserve. Please don't look at me. You hear me? You hear what I'm saying? It's a look or a beating to death, which would actually be doing you a favor. What are you doing? I'm going for a little walk. Walk off this urge to kill you. You should probably start praying. Praying. Praying Hans Vasily doesn't come home. Pray, praying hard. It happens here, right here. The geography of exactly where it happens doesn't matter. The 17th of June, 9.14 p.m. The sun's still up. Madam Stork hits Susie one last time before disappearing through the frosted glass front door. Susie alone. And it all comes back to her like a body from the earth, like a story you dig up. I hear the children panicking upstairs. And of course you know they're not panicking simply because of the fierce heat of this sun that won't stop shining, of this 
Sun that won't stop not going down. The children are panicking. I locked the bedroom door. I don't have the strength to climb the stairs. The sound of the swallows still swirls around the roof tiles of the house. This may be the last time I ever hear it. I wish my heart were like a beast going out to slaughter, a hen having its neck wrung over a stone basin. I try to feel something. I try to feel the pain I know I should be feeling, but there is no tension in my shoulders. My neck loosens, curves, collapses. A release that I don't know how to describe. The kids in their bedroom, they'll soon wear themselves out trying to open the door I locked. There's really no limit to how long my patience can stand the noise of a paperclip jiggling in a narrow lock. My patience can still stand that noise. I can't remember whether the shutters in the children's room were closed. I, I can't remember whether the shutters were closed. I, I don't know. I am, I'm unaware of the temperature in the furnace. How can I explain to those children that Hans Vasily Cruz may not be coming back, that I may never again be able to open the door and meet their childish eyes, that I may not have planned adequately, that I may have committed an act of thoughtlessness. I try to tell myself that what's just happened is surely not the sort of thing likely to alter the normal course of my life as I'd envisaged it. Hans Vasily Cruz left the room. His face was livid. He left the room and did not look toward me. He left his room and his livid face, like crumbling, chalky rock, frayed the edges of his cheeks and into his ravaged eye socket. I heard the scream explode from deep within his gaping throat, and I heard the screams of my children, first Lorik's, then his brothers, both still screaming in my head. But why is Daddy screaming? He screams like a sheep at the slaughter. The sound of a disemboweled sow is echoed across the valley. But no one hung him upside down from the tree. And I remember looking in the mirror above the kitchen sink, looking in every corner of the yard, and I remember, up goes my arm to hang out the washing, up goes my arm to slap one of my three children, up goes my arm to pop the baby's dummy back in its mouth, up goes my arm to hang the empty laundry basket on the wall, up goes my arm to... Uh, and down into my trouser pocket for a cigarette. Up goes my arm to slap that bloody dog that's shat from the garage door again. And I remember the dog shit, and I think about the flies buzzing around it. What keeps a leaded sun in the air? It's 9.22 p.m. The radio buzzes in the kitchen of Hans Vasily Cruz in Susie Stork's house. The sound of a dead sheep in the Pyrenees, a decomposing corpse seething with life. I think about the flies. I think about the meadows where my parents' sheep graze. I think about the apples we used to throw at them, rotting apples that fermented in their guts and made them drunk. And I think about the ones that got slaughtered, hanging from the branch of an apple tree by a rope around their hind legs, the blood flowing from the slit in the throat, the, the stink of wool you can't get off your fingers the smell of animal flesh that isn't quite dead yet, then the smell of fat when you start skinning the corpse, that smell of fat, a nose worm gets up in there and sticks. I think about it all, skinless, skipping thoughts, while the children wear themselves out, jiggling away upstairs at a tiny little lock. My heart is a clock and I throw its doors open to let in the wind and take away the screams of my world. Thought. A seething abyss in which Susie Stork tries to find some clarity. Everything mounts up. Everything gathers speed. The last few days all jumble together. The last few months become confused. The last few years melt and dissolve into each other. Her heart is a clock and she'd like to snap the pendulum. Susie Stork doesn't want him to come home. Hans Vasily Cruz. Susie Stork doesn't want him to come back. Hans Vasily Cruz. She has no desire that he come home. She has no desire to see him cross the threshold of this house. No desire whatever. She remembers the effect of Hans Vasily Cruz's voice. She remembers what it's like. She remembers his voice and the effect of that sound it makes, his voice. She remembers and time runs backwards. A few days ago, in the middle of the heat, the swallows fluttering about the roof. I'd like to shut those fucking birds up. 
I get up in the morning and I go to bed at night and those fucking birds never fucking shut up. Where's my shotgun? I'll take Loic and show him how you deal with birds. Are you going already? It's not a question of going. I'm making the most of a moment. Is that a problem? Just a quarter of an hour or so, free time with my kid. Fuck me, you've got them all day, all day they're with you. You get maternity leave and everything. All I get is the joy of working like a stupid fucker in a shitty supermarket. Check the fridge temperatures. Check there's no breach in the cold chain. Check the end aisle displays are in end aisle display condition. <laughs> Checking them a lot from morning till night. I go and I've come back a bit early, so don't be talking to me like that. I'm not leaving. It's not a question of that. I'm making the most of it. I'm taking a moment. Where's the shot? I'm on my own all day. We could have had a moment <laughs> together. Why are you on your own? Lord! Get the catapults if you can't find the shotgun! I get up in the morning not because I've had enough sleep, not because my eyes spring open, not because I suddenly feel like getting up. I get up in the morning and I do what needs to be done to keep everything working so everyone knows where they are. I wake you, I wake the children. Loic first, the second one second. The baby cries and I breastfeed him. Up goes my arm and switches on the coffee machine. Up goes my arm and switches on the toaster. Up goes my arm and picks out socks and clean pants, not dirty for Loic, and picks out the t-shirt you've asked for from the pile of washing, and I smile at everyone, and I watch you all leave the house, and I'm left on my own with the, that baby B that- People, people get up in the morning. That's what people do. They get up in the morning and do what they have to do. It's what we do. I, I don't get up for my own benefit. Who does? Who? When I get up to take the kids to school, when I get up to check that they both have everything they're supposed to take to school, when I get up so I won't be late and get there before the first beer delivery of the spring, is that me getting up for my own sake? What I think of what I am doesn't matter. What I like to think of me doesn't matter. What I want from the world doesn't matter. What I once wanted from you doesn't matter. What I once wanted for us doesn't matter. So what do you want? Lord, have you got the catapult? You can't dump the shit on me of an evening. You can't. Not in the morning, either. I can. We all have our crosses to bear. I've got mine, you've got yours. That's how it works. What are you doing? I don't know. The baby's crying and you're not lifting a finger. Her heart is a clock. She feels the second head speeding up on its circuit. She feels something give. I... She used to have a job. She worked in chicken, Orient poultry. That's where I worked. She took a job there because Orient poultry were taking people on. But she could just as easily have worked somewhere else. Sporting goods, babies, nappies. It was a toss up between poultry, sportswear, and nappies. It's not that she preferred poultry. It's that the child's potential is very quickly obvious. Are they more suited to poultry, sportswear, or nappies? It's quickly obvious whether you'll be a secretary, a chief production manager, or human resources director in poultry, sportswear, or nothing. I took pleasure in working there. She took pleasure working there in the chicken. I could have done something else. She could have done something else. Cutting and sewing. She could have been a seamstress. But that's not much of a qualification, so better take a health and social care course or child care than a technical qualification or a conversion course. I could have been a nurse. She could have been a seamstress. She could have been an embroiderer. She worked in chicken. I took pleasure in it. Him too. Hans Vasily Cruz also worked in chicken. She weighed in labors. On special days, she tied the chicken's feet together with an elastic band. Hans Vasily Cruz packaged and prepared the crates of cartons of chickens. Supervised distribution. They worked in the same place, Orient Poultry. My place of work. I did it because you have to do something. Hans Vasily did it because you have to do something. I weighed and labeled. On special days, I tied the chicken's feet together with an elastic band. Hans Vasily Cruz packaged and prepared crates of cartons of chicken and supervised distribution. We had our breaks at the same time. We'd bump into each other occasionally. One day, they spoke. Chicken's on the way out, apparently. Bird flu. <laughs> <laughs> We'll go into rabbit. Mm. They're closing down. There are rumors they're closing down soon. We'll uh, just go somewhere else? I'm going to buy a spar. Is that a car? Idiot. I better get back. Me too. That evening, he waited for her. She didn't have to make her own way home on that particular evening. He said, I just want to kiss you, Susie Stork. 
Feel your tongue slide in my mouth. Feel the heat of your saliva flowing in my mouth. Feel the effect of that in my lower portions. With my, your tongue in my mouth, my tongue caressing your tongue, I just want to kiss you just like this. We, we can't do that just like that, Hans and Sally Cruz. Close your eyes, Susie Stork. I put my lips on yours, you close your eyes, and my tongue goes in your mouth. We don't have to be in love. It's just a kiss. So we kissed. <laughs> we moved in together, me and Hans and Sally Cruz. <clears throat> Orient poultry shut down. We didn't go into rabbit. <coughs> Susie Stork took things as they came. Hans Vasily Cruz took over managing a spa. They carried on living together. She took up sewing, he managed a spa. Me sewing at home. For myself, for others. I took up sewing, pinning and cutting. Sewing, dresses, curtains, tablecloths, and... We've fallen into a routine. Routine? <coughs> no drama. Kiss me. You get in from the shop, from your supermarket, and you don't kiss me anymore. You act like nothing's happened. Kiss me, Hans Vasily. Make me feel, feel your tongue, feel the heat of your saliva flowing in my mouth. I just want to kiss you, Susie Stork, just like that. I, I just feel like it's only me slogging my guts out. I'm back from work, I work like a dog. You're doing nothing. I, I come home and there's nothing, I don't know. I come in from work, you're there with your stuff, you're there with your things, sewing away, always sewing, while I'm slogging my guts out. All these rags and scraps of material piled up all over the house. There's no room for anything else. These scraps of material, Susie, there's, there's no room for me. No room for anything else. I, I, I don't know what you say I am. I don't really know what you say I am to you. I don't know. You and me, Susie, we could have some common interests. I mean, we don't have to do everything together all the time, but we could share some things. So kiss me. I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with all this sewing while I'm busting my balls. You're still sewing now while I'm talking. I'm listening. That's not work. Sewing like that. This can't go on. Susie Stork on Easy Street. You have to get a job. She took things as they came. I looked at job ads. I asked my mom to help. I called my mom. I said, hey, I'm looking for a job. She didn't do it the conventional way. She looked for a job by calling her mother. That's how they do things around here. <laughs> Madam Stork takes out her phone. Madam Stork calls a friend of hers, who's recruiting sales staff, and tells her that her daughter Susie Stork is looking for a job. Madam Stork said to Susie, You have an appointment at my friend's mother and baby boutique. She's looking for a salesperson. Don't. Show me up now, Susie. Good morning, Miss Stork. Uh, please. Good. Please. We're just going to spend a few moments together so that we can start to get to know a little bit about you, so we can get to know you a little bit. And to make you feel entirely at ease, I'm going to let you speak first. Perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself. Would you tell us about yourself, Miss Stork? Susie Stork was not aware that this is often the first question asked by a prospective employer in a job interview because it's the top way they've come up with to get to know the candidate. Because it's the top way they've invented to try and analyze the candidate's communication skills. Because it's the top way they've thought of to make the candidate relax. <laughs> because it's good to let the candidate speak. I don't feel very relaxed. <clears throat> I'm not used to being asked what I think. Susie Stork was not aware that this is often the first question asked by a prospective employer in a job interview because it's one of the top techniques that enables a prospective employer to judge the candidate's perception of him or herself, while also getting to know his or her personality in a little more depth. Could you tell us about an experience at work you're particularly proud of? Uh, something you found particularly motivating? I had a job before. I worked in chicken. Orient poultry, that's where I worked. I worked there because Orient poultry had vacancies. I could have done sportswear or nappies. I chose poultry, chicken. Uh, my mom said, you're more manual anyway. You're not an intellectual. So I went for chicken. I took pleasure in the work. I could have done something else, cutting and sewing. I could have been a seamstress. I could have been a nurse. But no, I was in chicken. I weighed and labeled. I can tell you the weight of a bird just by picking it up and weighing it in my hand. Just like that. <laughs> 
Well, on special days, I tie the feet together with elastic bands. And during this working experience, did you have to overcome any problems or obstacles? You want to know if I'm scared of obstacles and if I know how to get around them and if I can stand on my own two feet without stumbling over the first little hurdle? Yes. You want to know whether I thrive on a challenge? Yes. Do you really think that if I was scared of obstacles, and if I stumbled over the first little hurdle, and if I didn't thrive on challenges, that I have lasted long weighing and labeling chickens at Orient Poultry? What made you leave Orient Poultry? Orient Poultry shut down. And it's hard to retrain for rabbit when you've been a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> do you enjoy working in a team? What do you want me to say? Just answer with a simple yes or no. Yes. Do you know how to say no? Do you want me to say yes or no? You seem tense. No. Do you live alone? No. Do you have children? No. Do you want any? No. Um, aren't you interested in children? No. Uh, well, I mean no more than chickens. <laughs> and yet you want to work in our mother and baby boutique. I... We sell children's requisites. I know. Look, I'm here because my mother told you to see me. It so happens, I need a job. So let's not beat about the shrubs. I don't care what I have to do. Whatever it is, I'll do it. I don't need to keep up this dialogue, this discussion with you, madam. We could come up with an easier way for you to establish and evaluate my skills and suitability to join your mother and baby sales team. We could evaluate my skills, but let's just not. I know that what you're looking for, above all, is, and let's not be afraid to say it, the absolute best for your customers. Because your customers aren't just any old customers, so you need sales staff. You aren't just any old sales staff. Your approach, the way you approach your customers, the way you attract your customers, the way you target them the way you earn their loyalty. You have a very particular approach in these matters. We know, of course, that the customer community is subdivided into individual units, and it will be my duty, should you offer me the job, to make each of them think, feel, sense that each and every one of them is unique. I'm the best in my field. I'm the exact thing your business is after. The world of, ma of mother and baby products needs women like me. You understand? I don't want children, which means I'm someone you can depend on. It could happen, though. I mean, you might get pregnant. Madam, my heart is a clock. It regulates the rhythm of my entire physical being. It regulates my every organic and hormonal flux. It carries a deep knowledge of the usually unknowable. I don't really want children. <laughs> Susie Stork's heart starts beating its speed in jumpy pulses. Her blood surges around the rocky channels of her arteries. For the first time in her life, Susie Stork completely lets herself go, commits to the big no, does what it takes to get the job. I promised my mom not to show her up. I want my husband, Hans Vasily Cruz, to be proud of me. You have a very particular way of presenting yourself. <laughs> I want this job. Excuse me. Sir? Hans Vasily Cruz, Susie and me live together. Sorry, did you just say you don't want to have children to get a job? How can anyone be sure? I mean, Susie, physiologically, your system wants children. Everyone wants children sooner. You're not going to give her the job just because she says she doesn't want children. You can't take a woman on in a mother and baby store if she doesn't want children. Do you really not want children? You, fuck, Susie. Yeah. I'm thinking about flies. Buzzing in the radio, I can smell the flesh decomposing under the power of the sun. I can smell the rocks and hear the wind suffering and the thorny shrubs clinging to the flanks of the Pyrenees. You can't say something like that. To say that just to land a job, you don't take a job at just any price. To quantify the things I've done and those I can't, I can't quantify any of it. I don't give a shit what you can quantify or not. You don't do that. Credibility. You just don't have any credibility in a mother and baby context if you don't know your way around sterilizing a baby's bottle, if you can't explain the benefits of a breast pump to a customer. You just can't. He has a point. What? He has a point. Your husband, partner, he has a point. Do you have to have given birth to be a midwife? Do you have to have given birth to sell dummies? What if I'm a lesbian? You're a lesbian? <laughs> I don't see why my lack of maternal cravings means I can't sell dummies. It's not just dummies. 
I mean, we have a whole range of products that you'll have to recommend to our customers. On the face of it, your sales technique on the face of it, your familiarity with the world of sales seems adequate. But how will you be able to show empathy? Because commerce works through empathy, does it? Do you really not want children? I don't know what you're getting at. I don't know why you're doing this. Hans and Celie Cruz came home one day. Hans and Celie Cruz said, that's not work, just sewing. This can't go on. Susie Stork on Easy Street. Susie Stork must get a job. I looked at the ads. I called. I asked my mom for help. I said, I want a job. My mom got me this interview. She said, don't show me up, Susie. I don't want to show her up. And I want you to be proud of me, Hans Vasili. I've given myself the best possible chance, showing that I can be a dependable employee. Fuck me. I don't know what goes on in your head. I don't get it, Susie. Everything's all mixed up. What's going on? Where are we going with this? What's happening here is, I thought we were going to build a life together. We are. We're building thin air. We're building an abstraction. We're building silence and emptiness. I said I don't want children. And that's what I'm saying. That's what you're saying? It's against nature. Against nature? He has a point. You can't say that you don't want children just to get a job. You can't say that. You can't say things like that, turning around to a prospective employer and saying, all cool and calm, take me and not her, because I'm totally dependable. And I won't leave you in the lurch by having children. You should be ashamed of not relying on just on your skill set to get the job. This is really bad. I'm, yes, disappointed in you? Take a look at yourself, saying I don't want children. It's not a bed of roses. Having children, I admit you weren't a bed of roses. But just because it wasn't a bed of roses for me doesn't mean you're not going to give me a grandson. I want you. Maybe I really want this job. Maybe you're right that staying at home just sewing is no kind of life while Hans Vasily Cruz is slogging his life away at work. I want to have children with you. I want to build something real, something true, something beautiful, something that will bind us together, something that looks like the two of us. I want your children. I just want to kiss you, Susie Stork. Start with the kiss. Slide my tongue into your mouth. Feel your tongue in my mouth. Feel the heat of your saliva flowing in my mouth. Feel the effect of that in my lower portions. Slide inside you, inside you and gently come inside you. That's all I want. We did what you wanted, Hans Vasily Cruz. I gave up this job and... Hans Vasily Cruz and Susie Stork are lying side by side. Hans Vasily Cruz sits up and takes off his clothes. Hans Vasily Cruz places his lips on Susie's mouth. He kisses Susie Stork. He places his naked body on top of Susie Stork's still clothed body. With one hand, the left, he lifts Susie Stork's garment. With one hand, the left, he squeezes the right breast of Susie Stork hard. And with one hand, the right, he does what he has to do. While something prods away and forces itself inside me here, I try to tell myself <laughs> that what's just about to happen will in no way alter or interfere with the arrangements I've made for how my life will play out. I try to tell myself as I'm crushed beneath Hans Vasily Cruz, because whenever it happens, it always happens with me crushed beneath the weight of his body. I try to tell myself that this won't make any great difference. Ooh, here it comes. For Hans Vasily Cruz, here it comes. <laughs> Not without struggle. I know it well, the struggle. I know how it organizes itself inside me. I know the way it forces, how it forces inside me. I know how long it lasts. I know how it splits. I know its rhythm and how it works. I know the sound. I know the smell. I know the yell that Hans Vasily Cruz muffles in my neck. I know it all. His way of fucking. How it goes organically, the trajectory, and how it shoots out of Han to Seely Cruz and always will shoot out. It's no good just closing your eyes. Eyes shut doesn't stop it, doesn't stop you. What I can quantify is how it's organized, the way the nature of my environment is organized. The incomprehensible weight of the thing that's coming in spite of me, even though I'm there and taking part. Up goes Susie Stork's leg. It's not me lifting it at all. Hans Vasily Cruz holds Susie Stork down. By the left arm, 
with one hand, the right. And he comes, and it stops. And I sit up, and I push him away. It's just after 10 p.m. The sheets are there. His skin's damp. Ugh, there's that smell. I close my eyes to shut it all out. Buzzing in the radio. Susie Stork thinks about flies. What do the swallows eat? Flesh or flies? Silence or corpses? I can feel my flesh decomposing inside. I can smell the woolly smell of a sheep caught in the fields. The smell of fear and piss splashing over its hind feet. The smell of shit from the body when it's torn open like a satchel. A smell that clings and gets under your nails and still hangs about later when I bite into an apple. We had three children from the nighttime squirts of Hans Vasily Cruz. They're beautiful. They look just like you, Hans Vasily. Especially Lois. Especially Lois. Mummy. Ah, uh, they're noisy. They're children. <laughs> it's great how they run around everywhere. A little bit of life about the place. <laughs> I'm exhausted. It's only natural. You're tired. It's natural to be tired. Once baby starts to sleep through, you won't be so tired. I'm going to stop breastfeeding. You're tired. One pregnancy straight after another, it's tiring. You're, you've had one pregnancy straight after another, you're tired. A spot of postnatal depression. Baby's crying. And to think you didn't want children. Baby's crying, aren't you going? The older two are so funny. It's such a good sign. Always running about and having fun, so joyful, so full of life. Oh, goodness me, they're beautiful boys, especially Loic. <laughs> He's so funny, always playing soldiers. And Hans Vasily's little shotgun, almost too big for his hands. The baby's crying. Aren't you going to go? This isn't my job, Susie Stork. I can't feed him. Not my job. I'm going to stop breastfeeding. You're just saying that because you're tired. You're, <clears throat> you can't just cut a child off like that. Mm. <laughs> Little Loic is so funny when he's playing hunting with the dog. Fuck me, are you just gonna leave him to cry? Do you want to starve him to death? I love coming here. I love this house. Everything's so... The children running about, the little dog running about with the children, and you. A lovely couple with their lovely children. Such a happy home this house is. He's hungry. My breasts hurt. That's not his problem. You're just tired, that's all. Get some of those silicone nipple covers and massage your breasts like this. Take some responsibility. It's so breastfeeding. If you think it's all just a bed of roses having children, you're never happy. You don't appreciate what you've got. You've got it all, everything, and still you're complaining. Think about those poor women who can't have children. You can, so be grateful. Fucking hell, the baby's screaming its head off and you're wedged in your chair like a big fat cow! Shut up! Maybe you should go. I don't know how you can leave that baby to cry. I never left you to cry, always there beside you, ready to leap into action. You were a very loud crier, such a high-pitched voice, really piercing. I'm not sure it's a good plan to leave him crying like that. Hans Vasily is right, you should go, of course, it's none of my business. And to think you wanted a job. Lucky you don't have one. You can see now you can't do 35 things at the same time. But it doesn't matter. You can't do 35 things at the same time. Just do what you have to do and do it well. Do it properly. Go and feed that fucking baby. I get up in the morning, not because I've had enough sleep, not because my eyes spring up and not because my body longs to stretch out, not because I feel like it. I get up in the morning and I do what needs to be done to keep everything working so everyone knows where they are. I wake you, I wake the children. First Loic, the second one, second. The baby's crying, I give him my breast, the one that hurts less, the one where the cracks and the skin aren't so deep, the one that's less in agony. And up goes my arm and switches on the coffee machine. Up goes my arm and switches on the toaster. Up goes my arm and picks out the socks and clean pants, not dirty, for Loic, and picks out the t-shirt you've asked for from the pile of washing. And I smile at everyone while the cracks get deeper and the sores bead the tips of my breasts as if my nipples had been sliced. I watch you leave the house and I'm left alone with this child and I'd like to cut my breasts off. People get up in the morning. That's what people do. 
They get up in the morning. That's what they have to do. It's, it's what we do. I don't get up for my own benefit, but who does? Who? I'm worn out. My heart's pendulum is slowing down. I want to lay waste the battlefield that is my home, throw the doors wide and let the wind blow through, set fire to my jail. When you wash up, you put the glasses away in the cupboard, so damp. You're putting glasses away in the cupboard and they're still really damp. Why don't you dry them? I don't know. You don't know? I washed up, I put the glasses away, I put them away so they don't get broken. You put the glasses away and the cupboard's still damp. You shouldn't put them away damp. I have to say, I'm repeating myself. I'm always saying this. But it's almost as if you don't care. As if you weren't listening to me. And you leave that baby to cry, you leave him. Do I have to go myself? Do I have to do everything myself in this bloody house? I want to go back to work. I want to get another job. There's no kiwi fruit left. The basket's empty. Why didn't you get more? And the silence that now descends is not, in fact, linked to the lack of kiwi fruit. <laughs> what Susie quantifies but can't is how it's organized. The way the nature of her environment is organized, the incomprehensible weight of the thing that's coming in spite of her, even though she's there and taking part in it. To quantify the things I've done and those I can't, the way your eyes rest on me, Hans Vasily, your gaze is so heavy, it weighs me down, and I can't bear it anymore. The way the weight of your gaze takes me to a place I don't want to go. Contradiction, confrontation, that troubled space between what I am, think I am, and what I could never admit I want to be. I'm sorry about the kiwi fruit. Could you not just, for fuck's sake, put that fucking light out and go to sleep like a normal person? On and on and on. Put it out. I have to get up in a minute. I'm sick of this and I'm tired to death. Don't put it out. Put it out. I don't know what you're thinking, Susie. There's stuff goes on in your head, Susie, I just don't get. This could all be so simple. If you took things as they came, really, Susie Stork, this could all be so simple. Now, put that light out. Switch the switch and turn it out. What are you doing? Oh, Jesus, what are you doing now? I can't sleep! It's nearly one in the morning. It's late. You need to feed him in an hour, and then you'll be tired tomorrow. What's wrong in that head of yours, Susie Stork? I shouldn't have turned that job down! You're nuts. You're out of your mind. You're completely out of your mind. Aren't you happy here? Why the hell are you bringing that up? That was more than six years ago. I don't understand what I'm doing here. I need to sleep. Hans Cecily, I think I don't love them. The children, I, I think I don't love them. I just don't. Their voices, their bodies moving about. Their bodies all over the place, all over me all day. I can't stand it anymore. They have to touch everything. They keep touching me with their disgusting little hands. They look like you, and that makes me feel sick. I listen to their yelling, and sometimes I think about getting the shotgun down and lining them up against a wall and shooting them, shooting them. So I don't have to hear them yelling anymore. I think that you put them inside me to make me rot away. That's what I sometimes think. I want them to be gone. I don't want them to be here. All this breeding makes me sick. Women should be sewn up and sealed shut. Susie! You are really sick. How is it possible that stuff like this can pour out of your mouth like pus? How is that possible? It's... You disgust me. You... I... How on earth could I have made myself sleep with you? Come in, you. You squirted. We have three children. It's just completely incomprehensible to hear you talk like that. It's totally, utterly incomprehensible. Don't touch me. You disgust me. It's not women who need sewing up. It's your mouth wants burying under six feet of earth completely so you disappear. Where are you going? I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect and I may have made mistakes, but I don't know. I try to be attentive and make sure that you and me and the kids can hold together as a unit. I know I'm not perfect and I'm all clumsy and I say things clumsily sometimes, but I thought I wanted you and me to be, yes, something solid. Hmm? Not something to be splatted like a fly on a window pane. I. Setting fire to my jail may not be such a good idea. Don't touch me, Susie. What happened to our contract? I'm not a washing machine. It happened.
happens here, right here. Somewhere you'd expect to find only a bunch of stupid peasants. As a proportion of the surrounding population, you'd imagine such people would predominate, and that these people's concerns, dull and uncultivated as they are, could be no business of ours. They have their problems, of course, but they're old problems. What goes on in their houses can't surely be terribly important, however problematic. The domestic problems they may experience are surely beneath our serious notice, and smell of cold coffee, cement, dogs, and wet linen. 17th of June, 8.27 p.m. Susie Stork sits at the table. Susie Stork sips her drink because it's been a hot day. She drinks whatever's to hand. That morning, Hans Vasily Cruz had said, I'll be leaving the shop early tonight, but don't expect me. Don't expect me to come straight home. I need to clear my head. How to think to uh, work out where I am with this, work out where we are, if we can still trust each other. A fly stuck in the window. Upstairs, the children are thundering about loud enough to burst Susie Stork's eardrums. The sound of Hans Vasily Cruz's car pulling up. Sound of the car door opening, then slamming shut. And he is, in fact, earlier than expected, is Hans Vasily Cruz. You're earlier than I expected. I thought you'd be later, not so soon. I thought I, I didn't know you'd be back so soon. You should have taken your time, enjoyed your evening off. I, I did enjoy it. Are they asleep? Not yet. It's late. Not as late as all that. They'll be tired tomorrow. The sun's still up. It's hard to get to sleep. It's hard to explain to a child that they have to go to bed, that it's nighttime and time for bed when the sun's still up. What are you doing half naked? It's just that t-shirt on, nothing underneath like that. It's too hot. I see you've been drinking. Drinking alone now, are we? I opened these that someone gave us. No one gave us them. I bought them. Me. I thought they were the ones someone gave us. My mistake. Maybe. My mistake. I got them mixed up, confused. Anyway, I thought a bottle's there to be drunk. It's there to be drunk, isn't it? Do you often open up a bottle on your own? I open a bottle this once, just this one time. I mean, look, it's not the end of the world. I don't know what's going on in your head at the moment, Susie Stork. Did you change the baby? Fuck you. What's this shit on the radio? You listen to the radio now? I didn't think you'd be back so soon. Am I disturbing you? Did, do you have a think? I'm going to go see what the kids are up to. I'm going to tell them to tidy up. It's late. They'll be worn out. It's time for bed. They won't sleep. I'll see. Don't you want a drink? You've drunk it all. And Susie Stork remembers. Susie Stork remembers. Up goes her arm to hang out the washing. Up goes her arm to slap one of the three of them. Up goes her arm to pop the dummy back in the baby's mouth. Up goes her arm to hang the empty laundry basket on the wall. Up goes her arm and down into her trouser pocket for a cigarette. Up goes her arm to slap that bloody dog that shot in front of the garage door again. Susie Stork remembers the dog shit. Susie Stork thinks again about the flies buzzing round it. Then Hans Vasily Cruz crashes into the kitchen. Hans Vasily Cruz slaps Susie. Like smashing a fly gets a window pane. Where's the baby? In his cot. If I ask you where the baby is, that means that he's not in his cot. He must be in his cot if it's in this, at this time of night. And I'm telling you that he's not! Don't shout at me. You're telling me the baby's in his cot. I'm telling you that he's not. Maybe the boys took him out to play with. I... He's not up there. Maybe he's run away. What? What do you mean run away? He's a baby. How... You're supposed to be looking after him. You must know where he is. A child can't just disappear. A baby can't run away for fuck's sake. Put that glass down. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I can't remember what I did. How can I trust you? You're his mother. I should be able to trust you. I trusted you. I take one evening to myself to work out, to think about where I'm at, and... I, I, he was with me all day. When I went to fetch the boys from school, he was with me in his pram. When I came home with the boys, he was with me. They had their tea, and I gave him a drink. I gave him a drink, the breast. He was with me. We went outside, and he was with me. He was crying, and he was with me. And I remember, up goes my arm to hang out the washing. Up goes my arm, and I can see the flies that come. You hit me. He's not a dog for you to tie up on a leash and forget. Where is he? Stop it. 
stop yelling at me all the time. Just stop it, stop it, I can't stand it. Telling me off all the time, accusing me as if I can't stand it. Stop yelling! How can I ever trust you again when you lost the stop baby? Stop it! I can't stand it. I can't stand it anymore. Those kids, three of them, I can't stand it. I've had enough. I'm on my own all day long. I forgot the washing. Hans Vasily. What? I uh, knocked. You didn't hear me, so I guess I came in because I, I, I was just closing the shutters in the bedroom, the bedroom of my house, the bedroom shutters on the window at the back of my house that looks out onto your house where you hang out your washing. I know, Susie forgot to fetch it in. That's, yes, the washing, but I mean, I wanted to tell you, Hans Vasily, that the pram, that little pram is still out there with the sun, and Hans Vasily, it's been so fierce all day today and this evening, and... Hans Vasily Cruz stands. He leaves the room without a glance at Susie Stork. Madame Stork turns her back on Susie. They leave the house, their faces ribbed like crumbling chalky rock, frayed at the edges of their cheeks and into their eye sockets. And a scream. <coughs> then a second. <coughs> from deep in their gaping throats. And the children come running down the stairs, and Loic, with his catapult in one hand and his little brother's hand in the other, comes running into the kitchen. Mommy, why are Daddy and Grandma screaming in the garden? Because that's what people do when they realize that someone has had a tiny lapse in concentration. That's, yes, I think I had a moment where I lost my concentration. Something slipped my mind, a moment of lost concentration. That could happen to anyone, and I think I... Everyone can fuck off for a silly mistake! But you're not screaming? Time for bed now, Loic. Susie Stork takes her two children by the hand, takes them up to their room and locks them in. Then she goes back to the kitchen. Hans the Basili Cruz is there. In the arms, he holds the baby. The baby that's been left outside in its little pram all day in the heat of the sun. Give me the car keys. I think it would be better if you didn't wake up, you know? That would be good. That would be best because I've just had enough. I'm so tired of everyone yelling at me. Susie Stark watches Hans Vasily Cruz take the baby away. She locks the glass front door behind her. We hear the sound of Hans Vasily Cruz's car in the distance. The car starts, moves off. Susie Stork by the window. Heavy heat, just before the storm. An evening when the setting sun never actually sets. Susie keeps her eyes fixed on the window. In the distance, upstairs, we hear the sound of children's voices. We hear the sound of tiny hands jiggling something metal in a lock. A knock on the glass front door. Open this door, Susie. Open this wretched door. And Susie Stork goes to the door. And up goes Susie Stork's hand. And Susie Stork's hand rests on the door handle. And Susie Stork's hand opens the door. And they're face to face. Madam Stork slaps Susie once, twice. Total silence. Maybe the bloody sun can finally go down now. Madam Stork disappears. Upstairs, the children will surely have to shut up now. Susie Stark prays deep down that they'll kill each other, just to get it over, get it all over with like the cries of the swallows that once the moon comes up. The radio's still on and gives out one last buzz like the flies on the carcass of a lost sheep in the vast emptiness of the Pyrenees before Susie switches it off. At 10.54 p.m. My heart is a clock. I could dig it right out of my chest. But I don't really have any special reason to do that anymore, or any real need to do that, because in fact, I'm watching myself, and it all comes back to me, like a body from the earth, like a story you dig up. My sad failure adequately to express my desire to refuse certain obligations of a personal, physical, and indeed economic character. I wish I'd had the courage to refuse to fulfill my conjugal duty and not have any children. I try to tell myself that what's just happened 
is not in any way the sort of thing likely to alter the normal course of my life as I envisaged it, but I know nothing for sure. The organization, the way the nature of the things around me is organized, the incomprehensible weight of the thing that's coming in spite of me, even though I'm there, I'm still there and taking part, all that escapes me. I turn the radio off. I unplug the cable. I cut it with the first knife that comes to hand. There's a lot I could do with the cable. So many ideas throbbing through my hands and in my head. I raise my hands to my neck holding the cable and the smell of my hand stops me. There's a stubborn smell clinging to my palms, a smell, an odd smell, the smell of wool, the smell of urine, the smell of I hear a shot from upstairs. The children have finally killed each other, I think. Then they hurtle down the stairs and down the hall. I drop the cable. Loic looks at me. And in one hand, he has his little brother's hand, and in the other, the shotgun. Hello? Yep. It's good? Yeah. Hello. So Magali Mugel, Sarah Hello. Rademacher. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Yes. So I have um, first one, um, one question for uh, Magali. Um, when did you write the, p the play, and was the play based on a real uh, event? Uh, no. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No, good, good, good. So, <laughs> I read that it, uh, you have been written um, several plays about women. Is this one part of uh, this series? Um, I, the series is called um, Guerrière Ordinaire. I mean, we would translate um, Guerrière Ordinaire into English like uh, I, two I, days I'm not, where I'm you not are. sure you, you can translate uh, this word Guerrière because uh, 
et de ce néologisme. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it's uh, f um, guerreros, but uh, in, in French, for the women, so guerrière. Et un autre guerrier, uh, the war, the war man or the war woman. So. Yeah, in English we don't have the she, she, war, she warriors. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about this series? Um, uh, it's um, a long work. I'm writing about this uh, subject, uh, actually. So, with uh, Guerrier, uh, I, I put this question. Uh, What does it mean to say no uh, in a life when uh, we are a woman? So what is a no uh, against uh, society or uh, no, normal uh, norm, the norm? The norm um, rules. Rules, yeah. Uh, and laws and uh, to um, invent uh, An emancipation, so of the in emancipation. Emancipation. Emancipation, yeah, <laughs> of uh, of the of the life. So, uh, in Guerrière, uh, we are uh, free uh, free women. The first um, is um, um, a poem about uh, a real fact. So the story of Madame Courgeot, I don't know if you know this story uh, in French, is the terrible uh, story of Les Bébés Congelés. Uh, oh, Frozen Babies. The Frozen right. Babies. So it's the story of a w w woman who was uh, froze two baby in Korea. Uh, but she's a French woman. Uh, and I, I will... I, I wanted to um, uh, understand why we can throw some baby. So it's a long poem, and uh, I want to um, I wanted to um, I don't know in English. I'm sorry, my English is not really good. <laughs> Une réparation symbolique. Oh. Ah. <laughs> 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 symbolic reparation. Yes. Yeah. The second part is a story about um, um, une hôtesse d'accueil. Um. Waitress, hostess. I mean, yes, of an hostess in a, a big, um, a big firm, uh, and uh, she can um, uh, um, add the sweet of the of the society because she, because she too fat. So it's not. Uh, She's too fat. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. 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 And uh, the free part, the th first part, is the story of. Um, no, it's not a story. It's yes, it's it's a love story, but uh, an awful love story, <laughs> uh, because all I I uh, I write I write is dark. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, but I love jokes, so, yeah, but, <laughs> um, I, I put the question of the homosexuality for, for the women. The play was, um, staged in London, uh, in, uh, fall 2017, um, in translation by Chris Campbell, um, How did uh, the audience uh, react to the play? I mean, were, were you there? Uh, it was at the Gate Theatre? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's... Uh, um, 
je sais, I don't know to say that. Um, um, je, je pense que les gens étaient très émus. I mean, the audience was very moved by um, by what they they listened and heard. There were um, several um, reviews um, that highlight the, the uh, impact of the text um, among the um, the community of women, feminist. Well, it it worked very well in uh, in London. I mean, the. Any comment about the the, viol the violence? Any comment? Il n'y a pas eu des commentaires sur la violence. Uh, I think it's not the more important. Uh, enfin, I don't know. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> And maybe Sarah, how did you approach the text with you with the actors? Uh, how did I approach it with the actors? Well, we got together and we read it first, just together. And then, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I had read the I had read the play before we got into the rehearsal room, and I had ideas about what really struck me first was the way that it's written. And you guys don't get to see it on the page, but it's very poetic, and there are line breaks um, constantly. It's it's like a very long poem, um, and so I wondered what that did with the rhythm. Um, and the syncopation, and it felt very much like there was a specific style, which I think you could see kind of in the reading with just um, a, a certain kind of punctuation. Um, and so when we got in the room, uh, we just talked to the actors about, I don't know, you guys were there. Um, uh, we, we looked at the characters and what they were doing and what they were going through, but it, it was definitely a different process than I would take with um, a play without a chorus. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about the the chorus and, um, and um, the role of the chorus for you. <coughs> How did you um, did you come to to the idea of having the chorus for this specific play? I mean, there was um, for this play there were there were a lot of reference to uh, Mede, uh, like um, and this play, like a contemporary version of uh, Mede, Medea, sorry in English. So, do you want to sp to speak of the uh, the chorus? Do you comment tu es arrivé au chorus? En fait, je ne me suis jamais posé la question de Mede. In fact, I, she was never thinking about Medea as a reference. Ah, ok. Euh, c'est enregistré. <rire> euh, ce qui, ce qui m'intéressait, c'était de, de trouver une forme euh, qui ne soit pas une forme qui mette à distance euh, quelqu'un qui ne serait jamais venu au théâtre. She was looking for the structure that would not put, not put the character at a distance, and this character being someone who would not normally be in a piece of theater. Et ce qui m'intéressait, c'était de trouver comment finalement on renoue avec un théâtre qui est aussi un théâtre qui raconte des, des histoires et qui transmet des expériences. Um, renouer uh, um, De revenir à un théâtre. Um, she's looking for a way to come back towards a theater that... Pardon, vous pouvez répéter oui. le dernier. Uh, de revenir à un théâtre qui uh, raconte des histoires. That tells stories and tells exper people's experiences. C'est très paradoxal, mais euh, en France, il y a encore quelques années, c'était très ringard de raconter des histoires au théâtre. Ah, so a few years ago in French theater, it still seemed a kind of radical to be to make theater that actually told people's stories. Et je crois que je suis une auteure ringarde, enfin j'en sais rien. Mais... <laughs> And she feels like a radical writer. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit more about this? What yes. uh, um, the yeah. reference? Why, why do you say that? D'un point de vue historique. Yeah. Il um, y a voilà cette tentative depuis les années euh, oui fin fin 90 d'être euh, dans une écriture qui revendique le fragment. Um, since the 90s in French theater, there's been a movement to um, 
right, I guess theater and frag, like fragmented theater, like, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Et de ne plus forcément, en, en fait, les auteurs ne cherchaient plus forcément à développer une fable. So writers weren't at that point really looking at developing story. Et d'un point de vue presque militant, euh, je constate que si on veut transmettre une expérience, alors il faut raconter des histoires. And she feels that in order to to transmit an experience that you must tell a story and she feels right militantly about this. Et parfois on essaye de enfin ce qui m'intéresse c'est aussi comment les femmes à un moment donné peuvent faire récit d'elles. Comment une femme peut comment une femme peut faire récit d'elle de soi, comment faire récit de soi, comment vous pouvez faire récit de vous. Um, and what is particularly interesting to her is how a woman can tell her own story. C'est peut-être ce qui explique que mes personnages sont très conscients de leurs conditions sociales. Which is why her characters are often very conscious of their own social condition. Et je sais que c'est quelque chose qui a beaucoup troublé les acteurs euh, qui ont travaillé sur la pièce euh, dans la production du Gate. And it's something that that conscience, that conscience of their social condition was something that was difficult for the actors in the production at the Gate Theater. Je ne sais pas si c'est la même chose pour vous. And wonders if it was the same for you guys. Yeah. Do you have the, uh, the actors? Do you have any uh, anything to share about this? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I've, I've been just writing down notes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so what was? The, I didn't the, quite catch the end there. That the actors. She wants the actors that they are. Uh, the, the characters know yes. about their social positions and yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we were talking in rehearsal about how, well, and, and Hans says at one point, you know, this could all be so easy, you know, if you could just, like, go with this machine. It's, it's the tension of her wanting to go against it, like the pendulum wanting that, uh, and being aware of that, that maddens her, right? So um, that, that seems to be what this is about. And, and we only had a couple days, so we only scratched the surface, but it's so exciting to explore, yeah. Um, I would agree with that. I think um, it's not. It, it's a little bit of a difficulty because we did talk about a lot what their condition is and how how aware they are of of the machine that they're in. And I think that was a discovery at some point that they that she is aware of what she's fighting against. I don't know if that's true for you, but it seemed like it was a discovery that she's aware of what she's fighting against. But we had a discussion about that, and I think it was. Um, a little hard at first to figure out what that thing she's pushing against is and how aware she was of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is that accurate for you? Yeah, or even if she can't put a word to it, she feels the sensation of it. It seems to be like what, what we were trying to find. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, no, the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the conversation that we had at the very beginning, I think it was like the first thing that came up organically was just kind of a, something that we have to address in almost, well, every room that I'm in, which is privilege, just every, every room that I'm in and, and leading a, a, a rehearsal process or something, it could just kind of has to be something that I'm aware of constantly. Um, and we're asking the question of whether or not the characters in this are aware of their social status and their lack of privilege or, the, or recogn recognizing this greater, um, uh, systemization of women in culture or in the world and kind of where we as as actors and directors and, and people in the theater are also in that and storytellers like what our own role in that means um so yeah we got pretty deep pretty quickly and then <laughs> had to kind of back it up again did you guys want to say something about um just that i remember us talking about you know why doesn't she 
say out loud, I don't want to have any children or something. And I think we sort of talked about, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that almost that the idea isn't a, a possibility or that um, not aware that there are other options, you know? Or um, just the, lacking the resources, I think you said at one point, star and the um, education, the ability to um, be able to, yeah, f put words to or formalize a thought like that, you know? And to feel um, that you want something different but um, be un unable to actualize it. Did you have something more you wanted to say? Just okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, along those lines, I think I did say that, though, that uh, she lacked the resources or maybe the words for her feelings of wanting to push up against it or um, a lack of knowledge that there's something more. But we also talked about, um, oh man, my thoughts are jumbled. We talked about the fact that she didn't have words to put to it, but also instead of knowing what she wanted, she only kn knew what she didn't want. But nobody wanted anything. There was, they, no one knew what they really wanted. So they were fighting against something, but not, not sure what they were fighting for. What's the goal? What's the, what's the ambition? What's the, what's the thing they actually want? Because they state a lot what they don't want, but never what they do. And Susie says, nobody's, what does she say? Nobody's ever asked me. Yes, in the interview. What I want. Yeah, I'm not used to being asked what I think. <laughs> I'm not used to being asked what I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, is there any question uh, from the audience? I sort of got the feeling that you know they're in this machine, this whirlwind, and they're they're caught in it. They can't get out. But what bothered me is she never, as you said, you know, looks at she. She never takes a positive step. You know, she she doesn't say no. She doesn't resist. I don't think. I mean, she, she was conscious that she was getting in it in some way, and. Um, I think she had very small consciousness of anything. I think she was like a leaf blowing in the wind mm -hmm. her, her whole life, I think. Uh, yeah. Because you didn't really find a lot of resistance anywhere. I mean, they go here, do this, do that, do this, and there's very little where she makes any, and she, where she shows any resistance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Well, I, I, she says many times that she's exhausted and uh, that um, but exhaustion isn't, isn't resistance. Yeah, yeah. I, she doesn't have strengths anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, so you find an excuse for it. I'm just, I'm saying something mm -hmm. else. I'm not saying she, you know, she wasn't tired or anything like that. But uh, I think that's a I great. I think she was aware of resistance. I think that's a great point. I think that part of what what comes out of that and what we were playing with also uh, in this process was the idea that she's stuck in something that she can't get out of, and that maybe the play is actually highlighting that there may not be options that you're aware of. You don't know that you can say no to something that is systematically set up for you to just fall into. And then at a point at which maybe she wants a job or recognizes that this is something that maybe she has two choices and one is not greater than the other. You know, there really are no options. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a system that we're stuck in. And I think part of the privilege conversation is we are all very privileged to be sitting in this room right now, and not everybody has that kind of opportunity and may not even be able to recognize that there are things that you can do other than go to work and come home and raise children, and that's just what your parents have done and their parents have done, and it's a long way to get to town. You know what I mean? Like, there's just, I think, I think that's, that's something that struck us anyway. Is that fair? Yeah. Hi, I just have a um, really more of a comment. I really liked um, the play very much, um, but I liked, um, especially where you know, I'm just hearing these comments and, and discussing the play, um, that it felt like she was stuck in some sort of like cultural matrix, where <laughs> you know she either the option was to be the mother to have the kids or to work in a mother baby store, <laughs> so she couldn't even. Um, break out of that, so there really was this this idea of emancipation really struck me um, in the play that you know is does it really exist? You know, it felt like the answer was no. Even if she was aware of it, she didn't have any of those options. And I just thought that was a really um, I liked how you 
highlighted that. So it's really a comment. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on the discussion that you were having, but first I also I wanted to congratulate the writer. I, I wanted to, to say in particular, I thought the language was very, very beautiful. Even without seeing it on the page, I didn't need to see it on the page. It's clearly a very poetic intelligence that's uh, behind this play. And I also thought the, your direction, the actors, it was really, really very powerful. So I wanted to say that first. To pick up on this question, if I remember correctly, uh, the character, our main character, says at the end, near the very end, I didn't have the courage. I thought she said that. Did, am I? Yes. I, she okay. Does. Yeah. So, yes, you, you said that, yes. So, um, <laughs> that then tells, so this would be my question about what's in the mind of our writer. If she, if she's, if she didn't have the courage to say no, I don't want to do this. That would imply she did have an awareness and could have said no, but she's faulting herself for not doing it, as opposed to she actually was just me mechanically going through the motions, yeah. and it was never even a question of having the courage to say no. Mm -hmm. So that would be m my question. C'était la différence entre est-ce qu'elle était parce que parce qu'elle dit à la fin je n'avais pas le courage. Alors est-ce que c'était vraiment Elle était consciente qu'elle avait des op autres options ou est-ce qu'elle était inconsciente qu'elle avait des op autres options on, on, on tourne autour de cette question euh, depuis, euh, depuis un petit moment, hein, dans ce qui est dit euh, par Madame ou par ce que Sarah a dit. Oui, elle a remarqué que c'est une question que nous avons beaucoup kind of circulé autour dans cette conversation. Je ne sais pas si elle sait qu'elle avait d'autres options. Ou euh, voilà, je ne peux pas répondre parce que c'est le moment où le personnage est parfois plus intelligent que celui qui écrit. She's not sure whether she is was aware of it or not because this is a case in which the character is smarter than the person who created her. <laughs> Mais pour faire quand même une réponse, euh, parfois on n'est pas heureux dans son job. So just to respond, sometimes we're not happy in our job. On devrait partir. And we should leave. Et pourtant, on reste. And so we stay. Wow. Um. Um, Magali, I just wanted to ask a little bit about your process. Um, just interested in your writing process. Like, does it take you a really long time to write a play? And with the poetic structure, do you read your words out loud so that you can hear the rhythm of them? Or do they live in your head? And is it really important to you like how the words sit on the page, if you understand? Um, sur mon processus d'écriture, um, c'est en tout cas, c'est une pièce que j'ai mis assez longtemps à écrire. So this is one play that she took a, quite a long time to write. Euh, J'ai commencé en 2011. She started in 2011. Et elle a été finie en 2013. And was, it was finished in 2013. Et il y a d'autres versions qui existent. And it's existed in multiple versions. Euh, des brèves, des euh, avec euh, trois monologues. Short were ones that were three monologues, shorter ones. Mais euh, voilà, celle qui est connue, c'est celle-ci. This is the known version parce que je pense que c'est la plus intéressante. Because she thinks this is the most interesting version. <laughs> euh, après, euh, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est d'abord la question du rythme. So what is primarily interesting to her is the question of rhythm. Et la question du souffle. And the question of breath. Et ce que la parole peut, enfin, euh, sans qu'il y ait de, de représentation ou de décor, comment on peut créer de l'image chez celui qui écoute and how can we create an image for the person who is listening without scenery or background or other? Et aussi de la sensation euh, de chaleur, d'odeur, ou enfin voilà. And the sensation of heat or smell or. Et je trouve que le travail qu'a fait euh, Chris Campbell pour la traduction est absolument génial. And she thinks that the Chris Campbell's work in translating it was wonderful. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, the translation, I mean, and uh, it's the right moment. I mean, do you feel, um, I mean, what between what you wrote uh, in French and with the English translation, once uh, interpreted by American actors, do you feel this uh, rhythm, the, the breath, I mean, the voice of uh, this woman? Uh, is there a difference between the French um, your writing and the English words? Um, <laughs> alors, en fait, ça va vous faire rire, mais il n'y a pas de version française. This is going to make you laugh, but there is no French version. Parce qu'en fait, le, le, le texte n'a jamais réussi à être monté en français. Ah, because the, this text was never uh, performed in French. Parce qu'en fait, la France ne veut pas entendre parler de ce texte. Because in France, they don't really want to hear about this text. Th <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> les, les théâtres qui ont refusé de produire le texte euh, vont l'accueillir dans la version anglaise euh, la saison prochaine. The theater that refused to, to produce it uh, in French is actually going to produce it in English. It's <laughs> here. Donc l'année prochaine, les Next Français year. pourront voir le, le spectacle anglais surtitré euh, en français. Next year, French people can en watch France. this play subtitled in French in France. That's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. 